Hi everyone, I'm Annie Barkin, Mexican Wolf Technician for the Arizona Game and Fish Department. Today on Arizona Wildlife Views, we'll show you how a foster program for wolf pups is helping endangered Mexican wolves. You'll meet a veterinarian who conserves and protects Arizona wildlife. And a Colorado critter makes an epic journey to Arizona as a stowaway. All that and more right now on Arizona Wildlife Views. Arizona Wildlife Views is brought to you by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses and the Heritage Fund, lottery dollars working for wildlife. Some projects made possible by the Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Fund. Once nearly extinct, the Mexican wolf is making a comeback. Numbers are rising and genetic diversity is improving. That success, in part, is due to cross-fostering. But genetic management right now is one of the most important aspects of, of recovery of Mexican wolves. And we're doing that through cross-fostering. We're taking wolves from captivity that are brand new baby pups, placing them into wild wolf dens, and then they're being raised wild. Cross-fostering has become a valuable tool in the recovery of Mexican wolves. In 1976, the Mexican wolf was listed as endangered after people nearly killed them off. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service established a captive breeding program with a handful of the last remaining wolves. So the Mexican wolf dwindled to within seven animals of extinction. The wolves that are on the ground today, whether they're in the captive breeding program or on the ground in the wild, all stem from seven founders. And so, especially with a captive breeding program, we manage genetic diversity as best we can. By the late 90s, the captive population was large enough to start returning wolves to their historic range in southeastern Arizona and southwestern New Mexico. In March of 1998, the first 11 wolves were released in Arizona initial releases of adult wolves, it did work, right? And, but it's not without a lot of kind of um, agony to some extent. They're more prone to get into trouble. They tend to create conflicts by getting too close to people. You know, these are animals that are raised in captivity that they take a while when they get released to the wild to behave like wild wolves. You know, it's a several month learning curve before they're really hunting well on their own and staying away from people. And people's perception of wolves really matters. You know, the, their experience with wolves matters. The Mexican Wolf Interagency Field Team spends a lot of time hazing wolves away from people and livestock, doing its best to minimize conflict and maximize public acceptance of wolves in the wild. So our wild population, it's growing at a healthy rate. People say, well, you established the program with adult releases. Well, the fact of the matter is we did, but that's all we had available to us. Now that we have about 40 some breeding pairs, we have a lot of opportunity to do this thing called cross foster. It works, and I think one of the really important things about it is it's much more socially acceptable on the landscape. You know, we're putting five to 10 day old puppies into an established wolf den where in an area where um, you know our stakeholders on the ground like livestock permittees and things like that um, are already used to dealing with that wolf pack and are already familiar with our staff and what we're really doing is increasing the litter size of that pack and, st and it's those animals are raised by those experienced wolves learning behavior of wild wolves from the moment they leave the den. 
We are really lucky to have big, huge enclosures, an acre, acre and a half large sometimes. And that allows us to house a larger pack. And we often prefer to house a multi-generational pack. Cross fostering is possible thanks to places like this. You're at the Endangered Wolf Center, which is near St. Louis, Missouri. It was founded over 50 years ago by Dr. Marlon Perkins and his wife, Carol. In the fall, we get deer donations from local bow hunters. So we focus on giving those deer out to our Mexican wolf packs and our red wolf packs. The Endangered Wolf Center is a captive breeding facility that's part of the species survival plan. The Mexican Wolf Species Survival Plan is a group of zoological institutions across the United States and Mexico that house Mexican wolves at their facilities. They work together as if it's one population. Through selective breeding, they keep the population as genetically diverse as possible. You know, it's very, it's, it's like computer dating, <laughs> you know. Um, it's, it's definitely like this wolf needs to breed with that wolf and one of them's in New York and one of them's in Washington and we have to find a place to put them to breed. The result of that matchmaking is a captive population with more genetic diversity than the wolves in the wild. Animals that uh, have a lot of diversity of genes tend to do better. They're able to fight diseases better. Their pups survive better. That's really important when you're trying to save an endangered species. There is planning that goes on year round, both in the captive community, which are the best pairs that, that we're going to breed this year in captivity and why. And then in the wild population, they work on radio collaring and identifying the breeding animals in packs. Yeah. It feels pretty good to me. We want to give these genetically valuable pups the greatest chance of survival. So we really do try to find proven wolf packs that have been fecund and, and have been able to recruit pups in previous years, especially if they have a lack of depredations or, or conflict behavior. Those are really the packs that we're trying to identify for the fostered pups. Satellite radio collars deployed on any number of wolves in a pack can help biologists locate their den. Yep, right there. So that's where it would start. When the alpha female is collared, GPS data can show when she whelps, meaning when she gives birth. So essentially the succeeded means that this collar is successfully linked with the satellite and we were able to obtain a GPS point. Got a couple failed hits there. When the female is underground giving birth, her collar will consistently fail to connect with the satellite. We can assume that that first fail of that long string is the day that she whelped. After the female has pups, she stays close to the den, giving biologists a cluster of GPS points all around it. Using radio telemetry, they confirm the den location and see how accessible it is. They should be going downhill with the pups. They won't get close enough to find the den because they don't want to disturb the wolves, which could cause them to move their pups. At the institutions that are breeding, they are constantly watching their females to see if they look like they're pregnant and if they're getting close to being in labor. Wolves only give birth one time a year, usually in April and May. So we have one shot at being able to foster. And then it's really just a matter of waiting until we have a, a whelping in captivity. And then once we know that whelp date, we get with uh, identifying which packs match in the wild. They want both litters to be under 14 days old and as close in age as possible. That's when mom is nursing her new litter and her hormones are going so strong, all she wants to do is bond with those puppies and nurse them. And those instincts to care for puppies, that strong maternal instinct is why fostering works so well. Once a litter in captivity matches up with a litter in the wild, it's go time. Everything goes into motion. Mark, we're gonna have you get the lid. We never take the whole litter because we do want the mom in managed care to have pups to raise and to maintain the genetics in this population. So usually we take about half of those puppies and then leave her half so that she gets to raise them as well. We'll just do a quick overall exam, weigh them, make sure again that they look good, and then microchip them so that we can tell who's who when they go out in the wild. We have to have the right animals in captivity. We have to have the receptive groups in the wild. 
everything has to come together. And then, oh, you've got to get the pups all the way from perhaps New York or Cincinnati or Seattle. One key thing we've had to help us is partnerships with organizations, especially Lighthawk, which is some volunteer conservation pilots that donate their time and pilot expertise to these missions. Well, my name is Joe Keaton. I'm a volunteer pilot with Lighthawk. We flew in three Mexican wolf pups from El, the El Paso Zoo. It's rewarding, yeah, absolutely. Ken Edelman flew a pup from New York. Sometimes the pups don't have to travel that far. In 2022, these Mexican wolf pups were born at the Southwest Wildlife Conservation Center in Scottsdale. The two pups, one male and one female, are processed. About an hour later, they're on an Arizona Game and Fish Department airplane. Shortly after they arrive in Springerville, Game and Fish veterinarian Ann Justice Allen feeds the pups formula through a tube. Okay. When the pups arrive at the staging area, the search crew is out looking for the den of the Panther Creek wolf pack. There's a problem. They found the den, but the wolves are gone. The female had moved the pups. We found where they had whelped, um, but the pups had been moved. The backup plan is to place the pups with the Rocky Prairie Pack. This time, everything goes smoothly. The adult wolves have left the area, so Bailey Dilgard retrieves the two wild pups. Okay. Then the team gets to work, microchipping and collecting DNA. Every year since 2016, we've been able to do um, captive-born pups into wild dens. You know, it takes two years for those puppies to reach sexual maturity, so the genetic benefit to it is a little bit delayed. There's no guarantee they'll grow up to produce offspring of their own. On average, only half of wild pups make it through their first year. Once they're in a wild den, they have to face everything a wild puppy does. Disease, famine, drought, um, illegal killing, all these kinds of things that, that wild wolves have to face. But many fostered pups are surviving, breeding, and having puppies of their own. Case in point, this wolf. The interagency field team recaptured him in 2023. He's the offspring of alpha male 1471, that wolf was born in the Brookfield Zoo near Chicago and fostered into Arizona's Elkhorn Pack back in 2016. Since then, 1471 has sired five litters and at least five of his offspring have produced litters of their own. Point. Rachel Crosby helped foster pups from the Endangered Wolf Center back in 2019. A year later, she was with the field team when it captured an uncollared wolf. It was one of our puppies that we had put out in the wild, and it was so wonderful to like have that all connected. And so being able to see a puppy that she personally helped put out in the wild, grown up, is now alpha of their own pack, and is uh, an adult in the wild, I mean, that is the ultimate success story. Good job, guys. Everybody back in the hole. It's absolutely working, right? That's the idea is to get these new genes into the wild and get them breeding and reproducing in the wild, and it is working. Credit goes to biology <laughs> and a lot of work on our part. <laughs> yeah, it's a success without question. When you put that pup in the den and walk away, you know you've done something serious for the conservation of the Mexican wolf. We're out here at Saguaro Lake uh, doing a fish habitat restoration project. We're putting Christmas trees in the lake to improve the vertical structure and the fish habitat for the fish that live in this lake. The Christmas trees we're using today, most of them we got from the city of Mesa from their city park drop-off locations. We also got some from a couple of Home Depots and Lowe's that they didn't sell. We can easily get 500 to 1,000, 1,500 trees for free and for the price of a cinder block and a little bit of rope, we can put in a whole lot of fish habitat in a day or two. 
And we save them from going into those landfills and use them for fish habitat. And they will naturally decompose in the lakes over time. The crew today is combined of Game and Fish staff from our Mesa Game and Fish office, and then we've got volunteers that have signed up through our new Game and Fish volunteer portal, plus an Eagle Scout. His troop is out here helping us out too. My Eagle project's going pretty good. It's running really good. The trees are floating a little bit, which is, we just tie more cinder blocks onto them and they'll sink. Four lakes, about 900 acres. We did about 500 trees last year. Like I said, we hope to do about 1,000 trees this year. And that'll about max out what we want to put in Saguaro Lake for a couple of years. Primarily largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, crappie, some channel catfish, a lot of bluegill, a yellow bass are most of the fish that we'll be using this habitat we're putting in. They're all structure-loving fish. They like to hang in and around flooded vegetation, flooded trees, boulder piles, rock piles. They like structure to live around. This lake over time has just, all the structural habitat has deteriorated. So that's why we come in here with Christmas trees or porcupine cribs or other man-made structures and uh, put it in the lake, you know, which give just basically a fish house to hide in, um, suspend around. So. Um, evade predation and then also predators know about it so they hang around it to try to get an easy meal. The Christmas trees we just installed here not too long ago, they're standing straight up still. They hold a lot of fish. Fish will congregate all around them. So we give the coordinates out. They'll be online here shortly within a week or two. It makes great fish habitat and uh, it just benefits the anglers of Arizona and helps out the fishery. How about like that? That's perfect. Yep. Can I hold it? No. Uh, yeah, you could. Just, yeah, just like that. Got it. Perfect. I'm Ann Justice Allen, and I am the wildlife veterinarian for the Arizona Game and Fish Department. I do really enjoy this job. most of my life. After graduating from veterinary school, Anne went into private practice. Can we get another stretcher in here? Let's get some water on this one. Then in 2009, she okay. went to work for Arizona Game and Fish. Make sure you get up under the belly. My role is to look out yeah. for the welfare of the wildlife. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. lots of water all over her body, all up to her head. Anne's and expertise helps. helps the department conserve and protect over 800 species. I work with live wildlife and I work with dead wildlife. I like to look at the feathers around the, the beak. I do a lot of mortality investigations. They start with an autopsy. It's called a necropsy in, in animals. When we're doing necropsies, we're basically trying to determine what caused the death and what kind of sh other things, factors might have been impacting or affecting the animal's health in the long run. Kind of like an episode of Forensic Files featuring wildlife. We look for evidence of viruses, bacterial infection, um, poisons. Um, many of the great horned owls that we have that come in have an evidence of internal hemorrhage that is often the result of being exposed to anticoagulant rodenticides, rat poison. Keeping Arizona's wildlife safe and healthy is Anne's primary goal. When Game and Fish captures wildlife to reestablish herds or reinforce declining populations, Anne is usually there, looking after wildlife and looking out for people. I try to make sure that, that um, our biologists aren't going to accidentally expose themselves to rabies or hantavirus or something like that. Whenever we capture wildlife, there's always a risk of injury. Anne and her medical team make sure the animals are handled in the safest way possible. They monitor vital signs, draw blood, and provide necessary vaccinations. Clearly what I like doing the most is handling live wildlife, um, you know, because it's just the coolest thing to be able to 
work on a bighorn sheep or a pronghorn. Yeah, see, now those are baby teeth, baby canines. Sometimes Ann is called upon to help the Arizona Game and Fish Department's Wildlife Center care for sick, injured, and orphaned wildlife. That's the cool stuff. The not so cool stuff is sitting behind the computer entering the data and analyzing the data and trying to figure out if there's something to going on and, or not and whether or not we need to do something about it. Like the endangered black-footed ferrets, the department began reintroducing into northern Arizona back in 1996. The population has been declining in recent years and Anne is working with the ferret team to figure out why. Oh, you already have the next transmitter ready. We're doing some research right now on quail, on whether or not moving quail from these urban areas um, around golf cape courses out into more of the wilder habitat um, might be a way of jump-starting the um, native populations where they've been imp negatively impacted by drought. The birds are banded and the females get a radio collar so researchers can track them. To see um, when they nest and if they su can successfully hatch out a group of chicks. We've done some disease surveillance and research on these guys to see what diseases the golf course quail might have and see if we've got any concerns in moving them into the wild. We handle more than a thousand animals a year, both alive and dead, and we actually provide information to the wildlife managers and biologists regarding the populations that they're trying to conserve and protect. Conserving wildlife is a team sport, and Ann Justice Allen is definitely one of the Arizona Game and Fish Department's most valuable players. This is the job for me, and, and actually sometimes I wish that I had found this job a little sooner. One hand under the chin, just like that, perfect. Okay. Connect with us on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Follow us at AZGFD. It's okay. We got a call to our radio dispatch from a citizen in Arizona, in Glendale actually, that took video footage of an unknown creature <whistles> running around in a parking lot, jumping into vehicles. Aw, come here. My first reaction was, oh no, <laughs> we have a marmot. It's a yellow-bellied marmot that somehow made her way all the way from Crested Butte in Colorado to Arizona and survived the trip in our record-breaking heat in June. We were able to successfully trap her and found out she had an ear tag and came across the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratories website. I called them up immediately and they looked up the ear tag number and within an hour we got a call saying, yep, this is one of our girls. When we looked her up, we realized she was a female and females um, are important. I talked to my students um, who'd been watching her all spring and they said, oh, um, you know, she's really social. I said, we probably should get her back. Knowing her history and the importance of what she plays into the research here in Colorado, that's what really triggered me into making sure that we got her back to Colorado as quickly as possible because she's part of this extremely long-term data set. It's not unusual for marmots to hitch rides and, and you know, find themselves in Crested Butte or Gunness. The idea that a marmot could get under a car and somehow travel about 10 hours um, you know, to, to the Phoenix area is just extraordinary. This is really the premier high alpine field station in the world. The marmots of the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab have been studied continually since 1962, and it's a, a place where not just the marmots have been studied for decades, but many other things have been studied for decades as well. Her brothers are hanging out around all around here, and her brothers have left their mothers, um, but we're gonna release her down by these burrows where you can see one of her brothers right now. I think that's Spoon, who we caught yesterday who said, where's Fork? Come on, Fork. They bite through the bag sometimes. Mm -hmm. So she's on the small side right now, but she'll gain weight. Yeah. I'm gonna drop her right here. Yep. I think we have 22 marked pups here right now.
pretty much all male yearlings disperse and many female yearlings disperse, meaning they leave home and go elsewhere. And what we know from previous studies is that those that are more socially connected, embedded in their groups, are um, less likely to disperse. That's the mom. Look at that great size comparison. It's a bit of a soap opera um, and, you know, a slow motion soap opera. They're not the most social animals, but that social variation makes them really good systems to understand the value of social relationships. It's important for us to keep tabs on non-native species that enter into our ecosystem because of the fragility of the Arizona wildlife in our structure. Um, from disease, transportation, to resource competition, all of those things are really important to monitor. And as a conservation biologist, that's why it was important for us to respond. Forks on the left. We're watching Fork and her brother forage together. And while it is next to a building, this is what marmots do, they eat. And uh, sometimes they even eat socially. So we have a successful relocation, happy story. She's back with her brothers. It'll be really interesting to see if she sticks around or she disperses. And it'll be interesting to see if she goes up and acts as an aunt to her many, many, many cousins and siblings. That's our show. I'm Annie Barkin. Thanks for watching. Now get outside and enjoy those Arizona wildlife views. To subscribe to Arizona Wildlife Views magazine, which includes the Arizona Wildlife Views calendar, visit www.azgfd.gov slash magazine.